They're already on college campuses across Arkansas, the class of 22. Or will it be the class of 24, if that? Enrollment is one thing, graduation quite another. How to move the latter closer to the former. And with state support essentially flat, how to cope with the expense. Also, is college sport on the cusp of a new era? Some thoughts from the new University of Arkansas head football coach Chad Morris on Arkansas Week next. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. A new crop of scholars, let's hope they are that, has arrived for a new fall term. The sophomores and upper class students are inching closer to the better life outcomes of which a college degree does so much to make possible. Desiring a degree is not earning a degree. There are challenges, academic and financial. So at the top of our program and at the start of a new semester, the Director of the Arkansas Department of Higher Education, Dr. Maria Markham, and welcome back. Thank you for having me, Steve. The, well, we've got a new year underway, new academic year underway. What does enroll, we don't know the official numbers yet, but what's your best sense of what enrollment is going to be? Right, so we won't know a definitive answer to that question for a few more weeks, but we can tell you that from conversations we've had with the universities, we're expecting a slight increase at the university level. Um, however, in the current economy, uh, we project another year of decline for the two-year colleges. So the four-year flat maybe uh, maybe a little bit better. Right, flat to a slight increase. That's what we project at this point. Uh, two-year colleges flat to a slight decrease, which nets out about level for the state. So that's what the hope is. That's a conservative um, estimate of what our enrollment will be. Well, for both four and two, for that matter, even graduate programs, graduate four-year, two-year. It's generally believed that a, a, a robust economy tends to hold enrollment in higher education down because there's simply so many job opportunities. Correct. Do you sense that that's the case here? I do sense that that's the case. When we have unemployment uh, at such a low level, uh, everyone's at work and there's opportunities for students um, to leave education and move into the workforce before they've graduated. So we see that quite frequently in this type of economy. Well, at the two-year level though especially, mm -hmm. Especially. Where there's so much vocational education mm -hmm. concentrated, mm -hmm. um, are we still meeting, or are, are we matching programs to need? Um, we can always do a better job. We know that we have a need for a more skilled workforce in Arkansas, but at this point, um, we're, we're maxed out with some of those technical programs where we're serving as many students as we have instructors and facilities um, to train. So we are matching the needs, but we're not matching it in the quantities that are required by employers. Well, and, and I suspect the same could be said of four year as well, because when you look at Chamber of Commerce reports from other Federal Reserve reports, uh, labor statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics reports, there's a yawning gap between jobs available, mm -hmm. excellent, well-paying jobs, mm -hmm. and the number of people available to take those jobs. And it's true not only of Arkansas, but it's true especially of Arkansas. That's correct. How do you bridge that gap, or is there? You can't make someone interested in, say, biochemistry. Yes, it's very difficult, and it's a problem not only in Arkansas, but nationwide. One of the things that we know, even if every high school senior that graduates enters a four-year institution or a two-year institution, we're still going to be short of the number of students we need to fill those jobs. So we have to focus on the adult population, which is a difficult population to tap into because most of them are already in the workforce. Leaving the workforce, even if it is for training that will get them to a better job, is difficult. It's hard to put your life on hold um, to move back into the classroom for those opportunities. 
Uh, we also know that our adult students, many of them left an institution of higher ed at some point in their life uh, because of either a life circumstance or because of a bad experience that they've had um, in higher education. So attracting those students back is a difficult task for all of our institutions in Arkansas as well as across the nation. We do a fair enough job, it is said, of enrolling mm -hmm. individuals in higher ed, but the graduation rate still lags. Correct. Do you see any progress? We have seen some progress. So our graduation rates in Arkansas have climbed a few percentage points over the last few years. Um, however, the raw numbers, the number of students enrolled, has fallen. So even at a higher rate, we have fewer bodies that are actually getting to graduation, which is really what our labor force depends on, those, those well-trained individuals to fill that labor pool. So our graduation rates have improved. We're getting closer and closer to that national average, which is our goal. Um, but with fewer students, even though the rates are improving, the total number of students leaving our institutions ready to go in the workforce um, is still falling. Well, a rate-based form of funding for higher ed as the administration, Hutchinson administration, has put into place. Is that necessarily the cure? Um, well, our funding formula Frankly, now is... Frankly, do you fear great inflation? Uh, well, it's not rate-based anymore. So in the last legislative session, we changed our funding process so that we based it on raw numbers because that's really what we need. Rates are fantastic, but what we need are more... Um, individuals trained to go into the workforce. So we changed the way we funded our institutions of higher ed based on student successes, not on graduation rates. So th that one is off the table anyway. Right. But moving individuals toward that degree at some reasonable pace, mm -hmm. even if it's six years. What's being done? Um, what we're seeing, um, hopefully as a result of the new funding model, is the students who are entering higher education are getting out quicker and with fewer credit hours. So they're spending less time in school and less money toward their degree. So we're getting more efficient as a system of higher education institutions at moving students through that educational pipeline, getting them in the door at enrollment and out the door at graduation uh, at a more timely and cost-effective manner. What about the expense though? That remains the enormous obstacle for so many families, so many individuals. Uh, the expense is an issue. Um, we have moved away as a society from public funding of higher education. More and more of that burden is falling on students and families to come up with a difference in tuition because of the cost. Um, it's a difficult problem to solve. It's not just an Arkansas issue, but it is something that we take very seriously. Um, students are more and more reliant on student loans. Um, we also know that part-time work no longer can get a student's uh, bills paid while they're in college. Um, at one point you could work during the summer to, to pay for um, a year of college. That's no longer possible. So students and their families are grappling with that issue um, of how to pay for, for college. And solutions. Right. Um, solutions lie largely with either student debt um, or increasing the public investment in higher education. <laughs> and you're advocating what, a mix? A mix. I think that um, student debt is a reasonable expectation for the value of a college degree. Um, I like to say we would take out a loan to buy a vehicle, but we don't want to take out a, a loan to finance our education um, when we know that the return on the investment for that education is so very high. Um, but I think it should be a reasonable amount of debt. Only enough debt to cover tuition and fees and some very uh, moderate level of living while you're in school. Um, I think that also increasing public investment in higher education is very critical um, as that continuum of public to private funding uh, continues to swing, more debt's going to be required or more family investment. So I think we need to look for sources of revenue to help increase funding for public higher education um, as well as looking to students to fit some of that bill with, with debt if necessary. Well, the, the, the political climate, frankly, mm -hmm. both at the state and national level, doesn't augur well for increased investment right now, or does it? Or right. what, what are you at? Um, well, luckily, higher education, um, after the last session, we, we did have an increase in investment. So we received, as a system, almost $10 million in additional funding, um, which was extremely helpful. It allowed some of our institutions to forego tuition increases for the year. So their students did not see an increase um, in tuition um, for the year that we're in. UCA, for example, did not increase their tuition um, for this year. Um, 
this coming year, we will only ask for about $800,000 in additional funding. So that we're, we'll ask for a small amount of increase, and that's based on the increased productivity we've shown as a but state. It does, it, but, but does it help much, though, when tuition is held flat, but fees at every campus mm -hmm. are up substantially? They are up substantially. Well, at most campuses, they so are the, up substantially. Yeah. The overall cost, though. The overall cost to students did increase. Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, we hope to hold tuition and fee increases at CPI. We don't want to increase tuition and fees any faster than inflation. Uh, but there's justifiable reasons to increase fees because those are typically fee for service. So we look at increased cost of technology, increased cost of um, student housing and, and meals on campus. So these aren't expenses that the institutions can necessarily control. So without increases in state funding, the only people left to with that burden are the students and their families. Kind of end it there because we're out of time. Dr. Okay. Maria Markham, thanks very much for okay. coming in. Thank you for having me. Please come back. Yes, sir. And in a moment, the new college term, the new college football season, and at the state's flagship university campus, a new head coach. What does Chad Morris have in mind on and off the field? I think the biggest thing you have to do when you develop student athletes is, is the fact that you have to, they have to understand you care more about them off the field than you do on the field. And uh, holding them accountable and equipping them for tools for life uh, and not entitling them. Okay, there was this knock at the door and there were two guys that said we're cold <laughs> and hungry. So we, we let them in. They're old friends. Steve Sullivan, sports director at KATV Channel 7, Little Rock, and David Basil, former Razorback broadcasting legend. Guys, thanks for coming by. This is a blast in the past right here. It is. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is. Anyway, we've got a new season and a new set of challenges, and not just for one Razorback coach, new head coach at Fayetteville, but for the whole, literally the whole playing field. Is, you can sort of feel it's shifting on a number of issues. Where, Steve, in your estimation, is college sports today? Uh, college sports today, I think, is a big business, and you think you're seeing it with Ohio State, where it's uh, protect the brand, not worry about the the person of Courtney Smith, if you're, you're well familiar with that, who was the alleged assault victim, uh, and what Urban Meyer, the three game suspension, which I think you know the world outside of Ohio, you know, views that as a travesty. You know, it, it, it just with what's gone on in the Big Ten. When you see what happened at Penn State, you see what happened with Larry Nasser at Michigan State, you think each step you take in that direction, you're gonna, the hammer's gonna come down harder. And then you get three games for Urban Meyer, you know, and it'll probably be, you know, his three games, it'll be business as usual for Ohio State, which is yeah. sad. Yeah, David? Well, thought. you know, business, I think uh, Sully's right. I think it, it is big business, and we're talking not millions, but billions, billions. And, and yeah. because of television. So football and basketball drive this thing, but I think going back, I've been reading up on the history of college football, and I think co uh, colleges now realize that sports, it's a great way to bring new students, bring, yeah. uh, bring uh, alumni back, and so colleges have bought into that, and they're investing in it, and it's become very important, especially football. I mean, and so that's why everybody wants to have a football program, because it could, it could be a great tool. Even Say something nice about baseball. While you're right <laughs> well, let's get, look at Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah, 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 one of the right. best in the country. Yeah, and so it's a big draw. In all seriousness, though, guys, we, we, we have, there seems to be a new awareness anyway, not necessarily in the athletic departments themselves. Well, certainly there's new pressure. We've got to look at the whole student. The student athletes, they're also students, or at least they're supposed to be. Anyway, uh, let's, let's go now to another quick clip uh, from, again, from Razorback head coach Chad Morris, who spoke, as you guys know, earlier this week to the Little Rock Touchdown Club, and he offered some glimpses of how he views the sport and its athletes. How do you know your worth? How do you know, as we talk to our players up there all the time, when you, before you leave from playing for me and our program and our coaches, you will know one thing for sure. You'll know who you are in 25 words or less before you walk out the door. Because if you don't know who you are in 25 words or less, society will tell you who you are. One of his other comments the coach was to AET anyway was that we have to be as concerned about the student athlete, male or female, regardless of sports, off the field as on the field, or, or more concerned with the athlete off the field than on the field. Well, you know, Sully, you know, back when I played, it, it's never been better to be an athlete. You yeah. have more resources, 
more counseling, more advisors, more support, financial support than they've ever had. But, but I do think, Steve, yeah, it's just I think society in general is making sure we pay attention to it, but, but they're putting money behind those things yeah, too. Yeah, it's great to say this in July or August, and I love Chad Morris and everything he said, but you move in November, you know, this is a win or you're out business. You can be the greatest guy. We love Brett Bielema, and I thought he was great to the kids, and I think he had the best interest in the kids in mind. Well, they ran him off. They pulled him into a room and fired him after the game. But I do think, I do think though, that you, you, this day and age, and this you, you better travel yeah, that road. Right. Like this culture, you better take care of the, the person and not just the athlete. Yeah, because if not, you, you know, there's. You see what's happening at uh, Texas A&M now. Their new coach, uh, Jimbo Fisher, had a player transfer to Arizona, and boy, he spilled the beans on what is going <laughs> on. And, you know, it's a he said, he said deal, but it's not the type of thing you want following you, uh, leaving you at a new, what, what's happened to him right now at Texas A&M. Yeah, well, I mean, Nick Saban wasn't hired to know, nor any other coach. They're not hired to be, in the end, at the end of the day, as Steve says, they're not hired to be counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, or priests. They're hired to win. The pressure's incredible. Yeah, well, yeah, again, you're, you're paying these guys seven, ten million dollars a year. Look at what impact that, that Saban has had at Alabama. Yeah. The, the, the student enrollment and the impact financially of it's been unbelievable. It's the best investment many will say at Alabama they've had ever. Uh, and so, yeah, and so sometimes you get that kind of return. But, yeah, it's all about wins and losses. Uh, if not, you're gone. But you see a change, though. You see Alabama, and, uh, you know, he's got an incredible win record, really doesn't have to do anything. Yet he goes to ESPN, and now he's doing a pseudo reality show, which is nothing more than promoting Alabama. It's sponsored by Alabama on ESPN just to present a picture that, you know, they're good five-star kids. They're nice kids. Uh, he has uh, the Nick Foundation where he gives up money to charity. You're seeing another side of Nick uh, Saban where they chose to spend millions of dollars sponsoring on ESPN to present the side. Which they, you didn't, you right. wouldn't think they'd have to. That He's a good guy running this monster program. Right. And let's point this out, too. Uh, this is a business where you don't have to pay your employees. And, and so, yeah. the, so, so the coaches make, are making all the money. The athletic directors are making all the money. That's why these sports, uh, the, the administration is growing because they have all this TV money and they don't have to pay the players. So, so the, the stadiums are getting bigger. Yeah. Uh, they've got to funnel this money somewhere. It's really well, interesting. Well, and funny that you brought that up. There is a, a uh, fair to say, a growing body of opinion that says it's time to reassess college sports, college football particularly, because that's where the biggest money is. Why should these kids take the blows when everybody is making money off the sport except them? True, they may be scholarship athletes. Yeah. Well, it's, you mentioned it's never been Do you better. see the tide turning? Of the, I think a little bit. You know, they're getting stipends yeah. now. They're not, they're not just going to school for free. They're getting you know, their education. They don't pay for anything. And in a state like Arkansas, they are celebrities. You know, when you, when you just look at Baz, uh, when you get out of the, uh, your playing days are done, uh, we, we you know, we scurry to interview Matt Jones or Clint Sterner. But players are getting treated better and better as far as their amenities at school, plus the stipends they get per semester. And um, I think college football has it too good with the coaches making yeah, can I tell, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. I don't, yeah. like, I don't like college coaches making 10 million, making more yeah. than NFL because, again, you don't have to pay your players. And so I don't really like, Steve, the, the concept of paying players. It opens up a Pandora's box because – uh, Arkansas can pay more than UCA will yeah. be able to play its players. So you have inequities all across the different levels of, of college football. So I like the old school days, you know, when Frank Brules was coaching or yeah. Lou Holtz was making $150,000 a year. And, you know, the, uh, it was much simpler back then. And you've devalued an education. Uh, how much it how much it's cost to go to a school now? And the kid who's out there, you know, working summer jobs and this athlete who's getting a free ride and he's getting the tutors and you add that up at a school like uh, Stanford and it's a couple hundred thousand dollars for four years. All right, you have student athletes. Do you see the focus at all shifting appreciably? More on the student and less on the athlete. I mean, how much student and how much athlete? Huh? I think it's, ever, it, it's harder than ever, I think. I mean, Steve, listen, yeah. these kids, they're, they're practicing, they're watching film. Most students can go and maybe they're working another job, but they have a lot more time available to them than some of these, these players. And so, and even the academic standards are higher for athletes than normal students sometimes in most colleges. One big controversy, and this network has addressed it, in fact, in, uh, in, in a special program. And that is the threat, anyway, of brain damage down the line, lasting injuries down the line. 
I had a privilege uh, on this night, we're the delight to interview Frank DeFord, late of Sports Illustrated, the late Frank DeFord. And this was three, four years ago, and Frank DeFord said this was right after the NFL reached that billion dollar settlement with its players union. He, said, he asked the rhetorical question, wasn't really rhetorical, how long do you think it's going to take for this to hit college level football, well, college I think, sports? I think you're seeing it on the youth level right now. I was over at a local um, sports store and asked them how sales were going, and sales are down in helmets because you're seeing more and more the younger kids are playing flag football. Parents are aware of the dangers, and uh, you know, there's something going on in the NFL right now where they've um, change the targeting rule and it's creating havoc in the NFL that anytime you use your, your, you know, your helmet goes down, your head goes down, you're getting a penalty. And, and what's strange about this change in the rule, usually the NFL is so slow to act on anything. They go through studies, um, they go through uh, just a, you know, panels and then they make the decision. This came down from the NFL like that, making yeah. me think that there's some study out there, they have, or some information they have on concussions uh, on former players that they're not sharing, that they would go so far as to change the rule dramatically. I'm not, I'm not sold. I'm not sold on the findings yet. Because you know what, too? If we're, if we're concerned, then where's the concern on, on girls' soccer that has the concussion rate yeah. of five to ten times higher than college football? But nobody wants to talk about that because money's not in girls' soccer. Yeah, concussion rates is, are worse on that sport and for females than it is males. So I just think, too, not to say that CTE, we can't find out sooner or later, you know, there's correlation. I just think we need to. Yeah, but to you got a time now. Think how big the guys are getting now and how I know, much faster. I know. I'm just saying that just because you, I think we're rushing a little quick to find it exactly yeah. the correlation between the two. I just say let's keep doing the studies. Let's be protective. Let's, the equipment's better than it's ever been. Let's yeah. adapt the rules. But I'm just not so sure we're ready to go. This is the fact. This is, this is the result. You're seeing schools be proactive. UCA, I watched uh, their practice the other day, and all the all the contact guys. Now they won't go. You won't see it in the game because you're going to see the emblem for the university on their helmets. But they wear padded helmets to help absorb some of the you know the yeah. the, the contact. You know, and you you've you've taken a a huge step. Uh, Cabot, old school coach Mike Malham. They all have baseline tests for their brain before the season, so it's it, they take it out of the coach's hands. I mean, Mike Mahan's old school. I was over there one time, and a kid had a broken finger, and he went to coach, and coach said, well, you can see me after practice. You know, <laughs> basically, I really don't care. But now that kid is going to be held out of a game regardless of what the coach thinks. Along those lines, my youngest granddaughter is enamored of this fellow or is keeping company with this fellow who plays a transplant to Arkansas, and he plays something called lacrosse. Yeah. That's a big sport up north. Jim, Jim oh, Brown, yeah. one of the greats. Yeah. And I'm told it's expanding in Arkansas yeah. now, yeah. northwest, and I think the two squads in uh, in central Arkansas. Anyway, my point is, my question is, do you see the literally the field of sport broadening? Soccer, once unheard of really in Arkansas, yeah. and now it's everywhere. Are there yeah. more well, opportunities I think the South is for the more young people in more sports? Oh, there are definitely more opportunities. I'm jealous of these kids. But what you're seeing, too, with younger kids, which I think is sad, is a specialization. Yeah. Uh, a great example is uh, there's a kid quarterback in tonight for Little Rock Christian named Justice Hill. He was an outstanding junior football player and he signed a basketball scholarship with the University of Arkansas, or agreed as a freshman. And last year they held him out of football um, because he was thinking of his future in basketball, but he's back tonight quarterbacking. But I think you see a lot of kids you know, forfeit, you know, what, what the high school experience for that dream of playing that one sport. And it starts earlier and earlier. You're seeing kids at eight, nine years old starting to specialize. Uh, it's a lot of opportunity. A lot of parents, ask parents today how many hours they drive around every week yeah. taking their kids to practice. I think it's never been an opportunity for kids to participate more than it is now. And a special emphasis here, is that we have talked about women. Title IX, I guess it was, yeah. just blew the doors off, essentially, and w uh, welcomed women into practically, or uh, mandated, in fact. We have a grand, you have a granddaughter who has a scholarship or two that have at Henderson State for golf. Uh, well, one's on a scholarship and the other's <laughs> following in her footsteps. I mean. uh, but at any rate, no, it, it, the opportunities for women in sport at the collegiate level, high school collegiate level, are greater than ever. Do you see them, do you see participation increasing on a par with the opportunities. Yeah, I think we've grown as a society yeah. to it. You're not going to have the big crowds maybe that you have for male sports, but I think we appreciate the value of what sports 
uh, can bring to someone's life, and females are included. And so it's been fun. Listen, there's some great uh, female programs around the country that people follow. Look at some of the ba UConn basketball yeah. and, uh, and golf. Uh, yeah. It's a uh, fast pitch softball. Well, the healthiest high schools as far as both academically and less problems uh, outside the classroom and, uh, are, the, are the kids that are in doing something after school whether it's sports or ROTC. And you look at a school, I was amazed at Cabot when I went to cover their football team, and I saw the band come by. It was like 150 kids in the band. And then the track team. I think the more kids you have participating, and I think that's a great thing, and schools are becoming more proactive in pursuing kids to do these sports rather than have them just sign up. And you have, right. to, you have to do that at uh, schools like Little Rock McClellan. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't depend on kids signing up. But a coach like Maurice Moody has went into the classroom and pulled people out. And I think that's the, the job of a coach now has changed in a way that you've got to almost recruit some of these kids to play these sports. 20 seconds left, Baz. You want it? Yeah, just listen, I, I love, you know, sports and activities are so good. You know, we've got computers, we've got video games. And it's not like when we were kids where we could get out and ride bikes and yeah. don't do that anymore. And so that's why I'm, I'm glad and appreciative that we have more sports available for kids and, and I hope they continue to participate and get them off those video games. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to do that. Dave Basil, Steve Sullivan, Great thanks very you. much for coming on. Thanks Come back soon. Yeah. And we'll see you next week. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.